Okay. Well, thank you so much. It certainly is an honor to be here, and um, thank you um, uh, for showing us around Stanford. We've never uh, been here before, so this has been, been a really enjoyable day. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, I won't repeat all this. I just told the residents during our uh, resident session um, about you know how things kind of change from uh, you know I was doing a lot of uh, research at IU and um, had an NIH award there. Ultimately, there was a lot of change and I ended up um, leaving and starting my own clinical practice. And then I moved my uh, KO8 award to Purdue. And uh, you can see our. Um, Clinic, which is uh, decorated with all kinds of stem cells all over the walls. This is actually uh, motor neurons and uh, stem cell uh, muscle progenitor cells. And um, we've put some amazing clinic staff together. Um, Tanya there actually is from the Ukraine. She came here and she learned English in two years and um, became an MA. And she, um, when I uh, started three and a half years ago, it was just myself. And since then, we added uh, Rebecca Risser who is a speech-language pathologist and actually was also a professional <laughs> singer. And then um, two years ago, Dr. Noah Parker joined me. He had trained with uh, Steve Zytel's out in Boston. And now we just added Gabrielle Ambrose. She was a clinical fellow last year, uh, had trained at Northwestern, and uh, now is staying on with us. And so we've uh, really just experienced incredible growth, which um, has been amazing, very unexpected, but I'm very happy. And so my research interest actually started with um, Dr. Anthony Atala. How many of you know Dr. Atala? Anybody? <laughs> um, so he is an amazing man. If you ever um, get a chance to look at some of his work, um, he is the director of the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Uh, when I met him, he was growing kidneys, growing bladders. You could actually go and see you, like you have a bladder in a dish. Um, and uh, you know now they're getting very close to the point of doing like clinical trials. Um, he is, here he is on a TED talk, and he's got a kidney in his hands here. Uh, but just really an amazing person, and he let me go into their lab, and that's actually where I learned how to grow muscle progenitor cells, um, and learned how to do the basic you know basic science stem cell work was during during my fellowship and working with him. And when I finished my fellowship, um, I thought I could go. <laughs> And just start doing stem cell therapy on patients. I mean, I thought uh, it probably would have turned out like this. But, um, I uh, ended up uh, going to Indiana University. I actually submitted an IRB that said I was going to like inject stem, you know, autologist muscle progenitor cells into patients. But I had no idea what was involved with a clinical trial like that. And ultimately, um, they said, well, you need to contact the FDA. So I contacted the FDA. And yeah, you, you guys know very well about what's involved with you need to fill out an IND application, and I got the IND application, and there's one experiment after another, you know, small animal, large animal, safety, toxicology. And um, so I, you know, contact them about how do, we, how do we start getting these experiments, how do we even know what experiments to put in, and they said, well, they can't tell you anything, but if you set up a pre-IND meeting, they will answer your questions. So then I called to set up a pre-IND meeting, and they said, well, have you set up a pre-pre-IND meeting yet? <laughs> so it just went on and on, and I quickly realized it's like way beyond what an individual researcher is going to do. And um, fortunately, there are some people who are doing this. Um, actually, some people in this room. Um, Dr. Chetri, Dan Rose. Um, now, is there anyone else doing that with you, or is that? Uh, yeah, NYU was doing it. Oh, okay. Group. I mean, yeah. Nice, and, uh, and it's kind of closed out at this point. Right. But um, you know, I think honestly, I think that's the way to go when it comes to trying to get these cell therapies into patients. Um, either having a stem cell team like Peter has, or you know, having industry to uh, do the um, cell work and then. And so you take a biopsy, you send it to them, and they send you the cells that are done, you can inject them. That's, yeah. That's for scar. Scar, correct, yes. And Peter, maybe you were saying you haven't started your clinical trial yet with this? Or we have not to enroll our first patient. We'll be able to it's all done. Okay, great. Good. Well, this is really, um, you know, one thing I'm really excited about um, 
because Peter and I actually started this years ago uh, with the sheep model, and he sent me some uh, muscle from the sheep. We grew up the muscle for doing our cells. Um, I, we actually FedExed the cells back. I flew out, received the cells, and uh, prepared them, and he injected them into the uh, sheep base of tongue and the pharynx. We found some pretty impressive improvement in the fertility. So now um, he has worked through a lot of red tape and a lot of experiments. Um, and I think most of us know about um, the tracheal stem cell transplants. Um, is everyone familiar with like Martin Birchall's group? And uh, um, you know, and I, this is it's it's really exciting. I um, you know had thought of these uh, this whole team as just being superheroes <coughs> when we first started doing this. Um, it's just amazing. Um, I do think it, it gets very complicated ethically. Um, you start to get into Really want to bring your research to the patient, and um, you know, so one of the things that they've been facing, you know, are investigations about whether you know could the patients have survived with the trade? Did they really need to have the surgery? Um, this I didn't get into this, but this was a little girl in Peoria who um, was two years old. She had a, a tracheal atresia. Um, ended up having the tracheal stem cell transplant, and the FDA approved it for compassionate use. And that's typically with these kind of cases, you can get a compassionate use approval without going through the whole IND process and all the paperwork. If, it, if someone has a life-threatening condition, you have no treatment option for them, and um, you know this is a possible possible treatment that might save someone's life. And so um, she ended up uh, dying three months later, unfortunately. And so it was just a big setback. Um, and it unfortunately, it uh, makes it that much harder to try to get these therapies moving forward into our patients when these you know, things happen. But it's also just part of the, part of the deal um, that there's some risk to patients when we start doing airway surgeries. And um, so, you know, my stance is, you know, I, I don't want to try to do everything. I don't think I can do everything. I definitely can't do everything now. I just want to do something, and this kind of theme kept coming up when we were we were just on a mission trip in Haiti three weeks ago, and this is the priest, and it was a really interesting message because it was all about how you know you can't do everything, just do something, and that's kind of how I feel with my research. Um, you know, we were fairly limited, but um, you know we tried just to do something. And you can see in Haiti why he's talking about this. We look, um, you know, it's a beautiful country. We were on a medical mission um, that uh, is really new. Um, this is only the third time that they've gone, so there's really not much set up. Um, there's not a hospital or facility for about two and a half hours. Uh, and as we were driving up the mountain, you see this kind of thing where there's just garbage all over the um, government. So you have animals just kind of cruising through the garbage. Um, on the beach, garbage all over. You have goats, you know, going through the garbage. Um, you know, these kids would be lucky if they had one meal a day. Uh, patients would be lined up, you know, 100 patients waiting for us when we get to these clinics. And, um, and this was the kind of thing we saw. This um, gentleman had this big cancer, probably a melanoma, and here he had these real fluctuant um, uh, metastases and uh, probably you know, just necrotic nodes. But this one was really hurting him, and it felt like it was somewhat fluctuant. So we put a needle in it, and the poor guy ends up having a vasobagel. So now he's got cancer, and he's got a vasobagel. And um, this Haitian doctor came and pushed really hard on his septum. So that's what, what he's doing there. Has anyone ever yeah, I have no. I think it induces so much pain that they get tachycardic and then they like wait and snap out of the vasovagal. I don't know. Um, but uh, but anyway, so with the mission trip, um, you know, we were feeling pretty discouraged. Like, are we really helping these people? I mean, are we really making a difference? And sometimes I feel that same way with our research because we're still doing rats. We're you know in a small animal model um, with cells and rats, and that's not. Um, we're not, you know, getting into the point of patients, and that seems like a very long way away sometimes. 
Um, but we do have a phenomenal team here. Um, this is our graduate student, Sarah Brooks. Um, this is Jason Oregon. He is a physiologist who comes up from IU School of Medicine, and he um, actually does muscle contractility testing. Um, this is Hanji, who's actually a Chinese otolaryngologist who's been kind of part of my team for the last six years. And then we have a bunch of animal technicians who help us with everything. We all know what the normal uh, video stroboscopy examination looks like. Um, Beautiful symmetry of the vocal folds, nice closure at some point during uh, voicing. <coughs> it's working together, and we all know the laryngeal functions. Um, we all know what happens when um, someone has a vocal cord paralysis. But I think the interesting thing about paralysis, um, you know, is really just in the last you know, years, Woods and described how. So these vocal cords are paralyzed, they're almost universally re -innervated. So it tends not to be an organized re but um, in the animal model at least, they're, they're typically re -innervated. And if you look at um, this study by Strom, um, he actually, you know, of course he did uh, the first uh, laryngeal transplant, and following up the EMG on this patient is really interesting. Did the transplant could only identify the um, right recurrent laryngeal nerve, so he was only able to anastomose that one nerve. Um, the left one had uh, no connection. But four years later, when they look at this patient, uh, both sides had very similar activity. Um, and you know, it's not organized, but the reinnervation seems to occur no matter what. Uh, Peter, have you EMG'd your patient? Uh, no. No. Um, do you think does does she tend to have? But she had paradoxical. Oh, okay. Paradoxical innervation. She did a selective innervation from the planning uh, to the AV ductal branch. And she still had paradoxical. Yeah, it's, it's really a challenge to try to get the nerve fibers to go to the right muscles and move the muscles the way we want them to. Um, you know, this, unfortunately, this is supposed to show just kind of what does happen. You end up with, yeah, firing a inhalation going to the adductors and the firing and swelling and phonation going to the posterior cricothyroid muscle and so you don't get the, the functional uh, motion that, that we're looking for. And um, you know in the ideal world we'd be able to direct these fibers to the right muscles so they would fire at the right time. And so one of the things that we were interested in is um, some of the previous work that's been done. Um, Randy Caniello had described way back injecting vincristine into the posterior cricothyroid muscle. Because if you could block out that aberrant re maybe this whole vocal fold would just migrate toward midline, and um, you know we wouldn't have to do anything else. And you know he has seen some improvement with use of vincristine, but it's not enough in and of itself to probably be. And then Paul Flynn described injecting IGF-1 plasmid um, to promote uh, innervation to the adductor. So our concept was that if we use stem cells or muscle progenitor cells to deliver a uh, neurotrophic factor, we might be able to um, use this model. Um, so here's our muscle progenitor cells, um, inject them into the adductor muscle uh, to promote re of the adductor while using that aberrant re to the posterior cricothyroid muscle. And um, so this we had done a few years back. Ultimately, we looked at various neurotrophic factors. This is just a survival assay. Uh, we found that CNTF was the factor that promoted survival of our cells the most. We also found CNTF promoted growth of the motor neurons the most. So we had um, isolated vagus motor neurons and culture, and then um, and found more branching, more elongation with the um, treatment of CNTF. So this became our factor of choice. We programmed our cells to secrete the CNTF, and they happened to take up the uh, lentiviral vector very efficiently. Um, they also express it in a stable fashion. So this was four months after we had injected CNTF into the adductor. Um, and we did find in the animals that had received the CNTF expressing muscle progenitor cells, there was a higher um, percentage of motor amplates with nerve contact suggesting tender innervation. Uh, 
Um, but ultimately, this ended up just kind of being a proof of concept um, experiment because when you look at um, this model, you know, I mean, our ultimate goal is to get these studies to patients and. Unfortunately, once you start using lentiviral vector or any kind of vector, you pretty much shoot your chances of being able to get it to the patient. So we really decided to start changing our strategy a little bit. And we started thinking, how can we get the cells to innervate themselves? Um, what could we do that doesn't involve a vector? And one of the, some of the studies that we looked at um, include you know, studies that have looked at Botox, and then you end up, you know, it, after the Botox is fully worn off, you end up with more motor amplates with nerve contact than you had before the Botox. Um, so our thought was, could we um, induce cells to express motor amplates, and would that actually help um, the cells innervate when, once they're implanted? And so the first thing we did, we actually uh, incubated the cells with motor neurons, or muscle progenitor cells and motor neurons were put together and we did find that we could um, develop uh, neuromuscular junctions in vitro. Um, these are little receptors between the uh, mononeurons and the uh, muscle progenitor cells. But as soon as we went to separate them, um, it, it was nothing that could be used. The, um, the motor amplates disappeared and we, we couldn't actually use this therapeutically at all. So then we reviewed the literature and we found that there were different ways of inducing motor amplates and acetylcholine receptors. Um, some described agarin with acetylcholine, some did neuroagulin. Um, we ended up using all three and found that we could get the acetylcholine receptor expression. And actually, as they uh, developed into myotubes, we started to see this kind of more mature motor amplate forming. So we hypothesized that um, if we tissue engineered uh, muscle polymer implants uh, with um, expression of these motor amplates, we could um, promote innervation of the muscle beyond that of just the muscle progenitor cells. And we used a PCL scaffold, so we anchored the muscle onto PCL scaffold. Um, a bioengineer actually created this for us just so it would be very similar and mechanical. And we had three groups. We had immature uh, muscle progenitor cells. We had a uh, myotrope group, uh, which was more mature cells. And then we had the motor entrate expressing group. And we seeded um, the PCL multiple times. Ultimately, we ended up creating, so this is a rat um, trachea. Here's the rat cricoid. Here's the rat uh, laryngeal cartilage. Here we've taken a defect uh, cartilage with underlying muscle basically remove as much as we can safely remove without creating a mucosal violation because um, the rats do not do well if, if you violate the mucosa. Um, and then repaired it with this uh, PCL with the underlying muscle. And we did find the animal survived uh, very well. We were um, surpri well, somewhat surprised, but also you know, <laughs> pleased to see that the um, motor expressing group did seemed to uh, have much um, enhancement in innervation. There were more motor amplates with nerve contact and much thicker muscle seen in that group. So this is um, just looking at some EMGs, and you can see the motor amplate expressing group had a very abundant activity, wide variety of sizes. Um, this is the type of muscle we saw. You know, Because we were just seeding it onto the PCL, we didn't get really organized muscle, but we did end up with fairly thick muscle. Pulling away a bit from the PCL, um, and the other issue actually that came up with the PCL is that it was shrinking. But from a muscle standpoint, we were we were pleased with the overall muscle result. Um, so this is Dr. Randy Pinello, and um, he's been working with the dog model, um, which we thought was very applicable, and he's already studied this in Christine. So we talked to him about could we do motor, our motor amplate expressing cells and muscle progenitor cells with the vincristine. And um, at this point, we've only done three animals, so it's very preliminary, and we're still trying to get this um, accepted for publication. But we do have some very interesting data. So um, we followed these animals up for six months. Um, the muscle progenitor cells demonstrated some motor amplates with nerve contact. 
Um, the motor M plate expressing group demonstrated just an abundant, um, you know, granted this isn't all over the slide, but you could find many areas like this where there were a very large amount of motor M plates with nerve contact. And uh, quantitatively, there were just many more motor M plates. Um, the other thing is we'd see areas like this with the motor M plate expressing group where um, you can see these are all motor M plates and, you know, all innervated here, just uh, bunches of uh, very dense um, neuromuscular junctions that had formed. Um, so uh, the thing we were also excited about, and this was, you know, really with he and I being kind of blinded, um, or I guess he was blinded when he, when he did this one, um, but this is what he found on the pre and the post testing. Um, the, uh, with the uh, pretest, so basically what he's go doing is he's going and he's cutting the nerve and he's stimulating it and he's looking at the um, adductor pressure. So um, this is kind of a model that he's, he's described. So this was the pretest and typically what happens with the controls is when he goes back six months later and he um, tries to uh, stimulate, it's, it's a much weaker response. So it usually declines by about 60%. So this control was fairly typical. This was the motor M plate expressing uh, animal. And you can see um, there was actually a 128% increase in the um, pressure of that adductor contraction. So, um, and then the muscle progenitor cell group, I didn't show this, I probably should have, but it, it basically fell between these two. It was, it was more than 60% contraction, but it wasn't as uh, strong um, so, we're in the process right now of just trying to um, get some additional funding so we can do more animals. Um, we, we actually kind of run out, ran out of money with three, three dogs, so that's what, what, what stopped us, but we'd, we'd really like to study that more and, and uh, find out if that's a consistent result, because it could be very exciting for the future. Um, some of the other uh, approaches that I'm looking at right now are, you know, what can we use to uh, a better um, hemilarynx. Um, can we use decelerized cartilage? Uh, should we think about using some kind of native substance? Um, so we we studied decelerized cartilage um, in uh, different forms. Um, actually, came up with a protocol that worked pretty effectively. But the challenge is trying to get the cells back in there. Um, you know, there's really not a great way to uh, diffuse. Distribute cells throughout the fascia after you decelerize it, and the same with the, the cartilage. So we kind of gave up on this idea, um, and I happened to uh, become very close with a collaborator, um, Sherry Voda Carbon. She is a biomedical engineer at Purdue who has created these um, collagen oligomers. Um, she's actually shown that if you take her collagen and um, bone marrow stem cells, you can get the stem cells to differentiate into bone, into muscle, into fat, into any cell type, just based on how she spins her collagen. And um, so it's basically based on the density and the physical properties of the collagen. But no growth factors are all required. And um, so, oh. so, I thought this was appropriate for her work. <laughs> Um, so this is actually directly from Sherry. She sent me this today, um, but um, you know she's in the process of actually creating a company where some of this um, can be uh, used in more of a kit form, where you can literally just um, you know take take your collagen, you add your cells, you plate it, and uh, depending on the formula that was used, it turns into cartilage, bone, neurons, uh, vascular networks. Um, so working with her, you know, certainly been an amazing advantage um, because it took us about one month to create beautiful con you know, cartilage from adipose stem cells. Um, she developed a, a scaffold for us, and um, we I chose to use fat and muscle simply because those are the easiest things to harvest. Um, ultimately, um, you know, I think from a clinical translation standpoint, you can get fat and muscle from and within a few weeks, we can have a whole larynx um, if we can derive um, the right structures from those cells. And so fat, um, the adipose stem cells, can turn into about any kind of um, you know, cell type that we want them to if they're 
right uh, medium. And here we've uh, incubated these adipose stem cells in chondrocyte medium. We have them on the um, collagen, and within a couple of weeks, we're actually able to get collagen type 2 expression, which does not have any overlap with the, the collagen scaffold. Um, and then in the control, we did not see that that didn't have the appendix. So we're, we're turning, the, the cells are definitely turning into um, cartilage. And the same thing here, we could see at one week, um, there was a little bit of pink forming, suggesting this saffron O staining was uh, picking up, which again is consistent with cartilage. At two weeks, we saw a little bit more of it. By four weeks, we're seeing some, some uh, prominent cartilage there. And uh, the other thing we thought was interesting is just you can actually see what looks like lacunae forming around the cells. So they're taking on these kind of chondrocyte features. And this is what the um, cartilage looks like. It's um, very similar to what we would you know, see as a native rat cartilage. Um, and it has a feel to it that's very similar. Um, the thing that we had to work out was uh, there's a tendency for the uh, cartilage to shrink. Um, if it doesn't have the exact number of cells that um, we need, or if, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember the two issues. One was the, the cell count was a factor O, or if the cells haven't differentiated in, into chondrocytes, the implants will actually start shrinking, which was the same problem we had with PCL. It's the same problem you have with a lot of scaffold types. So um, she found out that if we differentiated the cells early, we we you know, basically, uh, if they became chondrocytes early and kept them in that chondrocyte medium and then had the right number uh, or the right concentration of cells, that we can uh, have a very stable construct. And we're seeing that remain stable even after we plant them into um, the animals. So um, the other thing that we've been working very hard on is creating true tissue engineered muscle. Um, so rather than just seeding the muscle on the scaffold, we've been um, Cherry's collagen again and uh, putting tension on it and uh, have played with the medium to make sure that through and through the entire construct gets enough nutrient. And what we've um, found is that if we do all those things correctly, we can actually get tissue engineered muscle with the cells evenly distributed throughout the construct and you know a very nice, nice alignment. And this probably shows the alignment even better. Uh, but here we have the actin, which is uh, um, Daffy is showing just the cells. Um, and so going back to our rat model where we created the hemilaryngeal defect and we're um, inserting the um, cartilage or using the cartilage with uh, muscle to repair it, um, this is the kind of muscle we're now getting. I mean, just very, we can get very thick, very dense muscle. The challenge we're having now is just um, surgically getting it to look better because um, this is this is all you know our, our tissue engineered muscle but we have it kind of fold it ends up kind of folding upon itself when we put it into the defects so you don't see that alignment very well um, and uh, you know when we go on um, high power view we can see that we have some nice striations consistent with that skeletal muscle so and this was the um, functional testing that we were doing um, so if you look at this, this is Han, Hanji, who has amazing um, hands, and she's able to tie these tiny little rat laryngeas. So she ties one uh, suture up front, and then one in the vocal process of the arytenoid. Um, and um, basically, we can test one vocal cord at a time. We're actually testing the adductor squeeze. So if you watch really closely here, <laughs> so, a little rock. There we go. And the little rock there. Which, what's up? Why is it in fluid? Oh, that just to keep the um, tissue alive. So yeah, it keeps the keep keep it in a uh, bath. I mean, this is a, it. It has to be done like within minutes. You know, we he actually drives all the way up from Indy, so we can take it. We take it out of the animal. We put it in here, and we just test it right away. Because if you wait for like more than an hour. Um, it, it doesn't contract anymore, so, so we have to be kind of you know, quick about it. And that's why, yeah, you keep it in the, in the salt solution. The electrodes um, stimulate um, the muscle, then um, they have a transducer that detects the force of the contraction, so we can compare our, our implant to the other side. So we're still in the process of analyzing all the data, but we are seeing some good contractions on both sides, whether or not we 
use insert the implant um, or you know and on the native side of course um, and we're seeing some very strong uh, innervation of the muscle um, very similar to what we saw with the injection technique um, so our ultimate goal is that we'd like to create a tissue engineered larynx um, you all know Jennifer Long, you know, okay, yeah. So she has done some really nice work with um, adipose stem cells and creating a vibratory surface of the vocal fold. So we're, um, we've been talking for quite a long time. I'd like to collaborate with her so we can put this all together and ultimately create, you know, a complete larynx. And so getting back to the concept of, you know, right now we're just working on something small. Um, you know, I hope that someday this will be something very large. I know my, my old chairman used to always say, you know, are you still playing with gerbils? And I would say, well, yeah, I'm, you know, we're still playing with rats, but um, we hope that someday it will help somebody. And um, this is kind of how, um, you know, the Haiti trip ended up. We, we ultimately found some patients. Uh, with the big gaping wounds that we could uh, sew up. Um, this was a little girl who had a bead in her ear for three years. So, um, yeah, she actually had gone, to, they, someone drove her down to the hospital two hours away. And they couldn't get it out, and um, so we were able to get it out. She was ecstatic then, so she could hear. This gentleman had some kind of trauma to his ear and hasn't been able to hear since, and we found this bead in his ear with the wax. So. He was also happy. Um, this little girl actually came back with one of the nurses, and she's going to be having surgery in Indianapolis soon. And then this is a student there who would like to go to nursing school and come back and set up a new clinic. So we are very excited, you know, that you know, by the end of it all, even though it felt like we were doing something very, very small, we hope that uh, it will lead to a lot bigger things. So ended up being quite happy, and this was our celebration at the end. I can't hear it. There's a volume up. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, here's the... This is our final That's thing. nice. One That's... more winner, winner. That's a beautiful picture. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, any questions? I don't know enough to ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the ME um, testing, that group that had the best outcome, um, you had Agrin and what were the other? Neuroagulin. Differentiate between which of those, the agrin causing nicotinic receptor aggregation was the main thing, or what was the real primary reason for, I didn't really kind of get what your thought was about why that was the most successful, which of those you differentiate? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know which one is doing what. Some have done it with only acetylcholine, you know, just adding acetylcholine, and they don't have the other factors in there, so. Um, I know, um, I don't know which yeah, I don't know the why. I know she, um, that my, my assistant had tried multiple different concentrations with the three factors, with, you know, leaving them in and out, and um, yeah. that worked the best. But I, don't know. I mean, Agrin was discovered here at Stanford mm. by uh, Jack McMahon. I worked in his lab many years ago. I hadn't oh. seen that made that word in a long time. Oh, um, and it was ultimately cloned here also by a different competing lab at Stanford, which was a big controversy at the time. Oh, the receptor was actually, I should say, not Agrin. Uh, so um, I'm just curious because you have that up there, you know, which of those factors you thought maybe was most important. And Agrin is, is one of the first uh, factors, if you will, that was shown to cause aggregation of the neuro and formation of nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction secreted by the distal uh, you know, axon. Mm -hmm. uh, so just kind of curious about what you thought, which of those. It's just like yeah, it's more exploring things that's you've tried. Very interesting. But, yeah. I'll, I'll have to look. I'll have to research that more. I didn't know that. Yeah, we really just kind of came across it in some different protocols and yeah. you know, tried it.